Hello everybody, so thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at meningitis finals. So just a brief introduction about the Medicine Guide. So the Medicine Guide is a YouTube channel which aims to support medical students throughout their entire journey at medical school. So I've made videos on how to be successful at medical school. I've got videos focusing on how to tackle anatomy, histology, CBL, PBL teaching. I've also got videos focusing on the high yield topics like crop and finals, such as an imaging quiz, a CT head imaging quiz. And I've got videos focusing on the high yield topics for obstetrics, pediatrics, cardiology, and also neurology. So without further ado, let's get started. So the outline of today's video is that we'll be looking at the causes of meningitis, then the signs and symptoms, and the test investigations, and finally the management. So meningitis arises because of an infection of the meninges leading to inflammation of the meninges. Now the meninges is this protective layer found across the brain and the spinal cord. Now the meninges consists of the dura matter, arachnoid matter and pia matter. Now the causes of meningitis varies depending upon your age and also to a certain extent um, any sort of past medical history that you've got. So let's initially focus on age. So if a patient is aged under the age of three months they're likely to suffer from meningitis due to group B streptococcus infection, E. coli infection, or a Listeria monocytogenes infection. If the patient is under the age of six years old, so I do appreciate there is some crossover between um, the neonates to three months category and the one month to six years old category. But if you're under the age of six, you're likely to develop meningitis due to an infection with Neisseria meningitis, Mophilus influenza type B, or Streptococcus pneumonia. If you're aged above six years old until the age of 60, you're at risk of developing meningitis if you're infected with the following organisms, Streptococcus pneumoniae and Neisseria meningitis. And if you're above the age of 60, you're at risk of developing meningitis if you are infected with Streptococcus pneumoniae, Listeria meningitis, and Listeria monocytogenes. So I would strongly recommend that you learn the underlying effective organisms that lead to meningitis because it's something that they can quite easily throw in an SBA. They can easily give you um, a generic description of a patient who's aged perhaps seven years old and you would be expected to pick the most likely infective organism leading to meningitis in that patient's case. So I would say it's very high yield. Please be aware of what the underlying causes are of meningitis. Now in terms of your past medical history, so if the patient is immunocompromised, so they might be suffering from HIV, they might have leukemia, they might be taking chemotherapy medication, as part of active management of cancer, for instance, then they're likely to develop meningitis from a Listeria monocytogenes infection. Also, patients can develop a TB meningitis if they're infected with Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So please just keep that in mind. Now in terms of signs and symptoms, there's a typical triad of where patients are complaining of headache, fever, neck stiffness or neutral rigidity. So that's the classic triad that you need to be able to pick out in the SBA in a patient presenting potentially with meningitis. Now another classic finding is this non-blanching purpuric rash. So this non-blanching purpuric rash should immediately send alarm bells into your mind and make you suspicious of potentially a meningococcal septicemia. Okay? So this is an example of a non-blanching purpuric rash. So this is a purpuric rash or a petechial rash, which is persisting despite glass being pressed against it. So if you have a look in the picture, you can see that the glass is being pressed against the patient's leg and the rash is still persisting, so the rash hasn't faded. So this is an example of a non-blanching purpuric rash. Other signs and symptoms of meningitis involves photophobia and phonophobia. So photophobia is when the patient has increasingly 
severe discomfort upon exposure to bright lights. And phonophobia is again extreme discomfort and exposure to loud noises. Now, two of the key signs that you need to be aware of in relation to meningitis involves Kerning sign and Brzezinski sign. I don't think these two signs are common in clinical practice, but these two signs do classically present in SBA, so you do have to be aware of them. So initially, Kerning sign is when there is a resistance to full extension of the leg at the knee when the hip is flexed. Okay. And Brzezinski sign is when patient will flex both hips and knees when the neck is passively flexed. So again, just be aware of these two signs because it does classically present in SBAs. Now in terms of tests and investigations, we need to perform a CT head to exclude for signs of an obstructive hydrocephalus. Now, CT head can be postponed until after the patient has received antibiotics because that's really important. And essentially, the lumbar puncture is going to be your gold standard in terms of investigating for meningitis. However, a lumbar puncture is contraindicated in patients who have an obstructive hydrocephalus, so that's why it's important to do a CT head first. Lumbar puncture is also contraindicated in patients who are presenting with signs of a meningococcal septicemia, so that's patients with this non-blanching rash, because in those situations, a blood culture and a PCR is preferred. Patients presenting with focal neurological signs, papilledema, so blurring of the optic disc on fundoscopy. Patients presenting with a significant bulging of the fontanelle and DIC are all contraindications of performing a lumbar puncture. Okay. So let's just have a look at the CSF findings in a bit more detail. So you need to be aware of everything that's essentially on this table. So there are different causes of meningitis as we spoke previously. There are bacterial causes, there are fungal causes, viral causes and um, tuberculosis causes. So mycobacteria tuberculosis. And the CSF will present differently in each of those different scenarios. So classically in SBA, you might be given CSF findings following a lumbar puncture, and you'll be expected to interpret those findings and identify if the underlying infection was a bacterial infection, a viral infection, a TB infection, or a fungal infection. So this is something that you need to be very comfortable about. Uh, one thing to bear in mind is that where it mentions a bacterial infection for meningitis and it describes the appearance of what's known as polymorphs. So polymorphs includes basophils, azinophils and neutrophils. Okay, so I would say that this slide is very high yield. So if you want to pause the video at this point and just make a few notes, you can do. Otherwise, I'm going to carry on with the video in the next five seconds. So you can pause it at this point. Okay, I'm going to carry on with the video. So you can always go back to this part of the video if you like, but I'm going to carry on now. So after performing a lumbar puncture, we can do a polymerase chain reaction of the CSF fluid itself. And we can also consider a blood culture, particularly in patients who are presenting with signs suggestive of a meningococcal septicemia. So that's patients presenting with this non-blanching papyric rash. So now let's look at the management of a patient presenting with a non-blanching rash or signs that are suggestive of a meningococcal septicemia. So the pre-hospital management involves admitting the patient to hospital by calling 999 and administering a single dose of either the IV or IM benzyl penicillin at the earliest opportunity as long as it doesn't delay hospital transfer. Now, IV or IM benzyl penicillin can be offered by the paramedic or it can be offered by a GP if the patient is obviously presenting at a GP practice. Now, benzyl penicillin should be withheld if the patient has a history of penicillin anaphylaxis. Now, in this particular circumstance, if the patient has a previous history of experiencing a rash following the use of penicillin, then that is not a contraindication 
of receiving benzyl penicillin in this circumstance. Okay. Now, the management of a patient presenting with a non-blanching rash is as follows. So again, this is the pre-hospital management, so we need to admit these patients to hospital by calling 999. Now, in these patients, we shouldn't routinely offer antibiotics unless the hospital transfer has been delayed. If the hospital transfer has been delayed in these patients, we could offer them benzyl penicillin or cefotaxim or even chloramphenicol. Okay, but the key thing to remember in a patient who is suspected of meningitis but they don't have a non-blanching rash is that our priority in this situation is to admit the patients to hospital and if there is a delay for whatever reason then we would consider antibiotics. Okay, now once they're at hospital the antibiotics they are given will vary upon the type of underlying infection that's leading to the meningitis and also the patient's age. Also, whilst they're in hospital, patients will be offered IV fluids and cerebral monitoring will be performed. Mechanical ventilation will be considered if obviously the patient is in a state of respiratory compromise. So I think it's important just to have an appreciation of the different types of antibiotics that are offered as part of hospital management, but I don't think it's something that you'd need to know um, back to front as such. But if you want, then you can pause the video at this point just to take notes of the different antibiotics. Otherwise, I'm going to carry on in the next five seconds. OK, I'm going to carry on. You can always come back to this if you like. Another thing to consider is public health. So meningitis is a notifiable condition, so Public Health England must be informed if a patient is presenting with meningitis. We need to offer ciprofloxacin within 24 hours to the patient's close contacts. So the highest risk of meningococcal disease is within the first seven days, but this risk can persist for four weeks. Now, this prophylax treatment of ciprofloxacin is given to patients who have shared the same household settings with the patient seven days prior to the onset of the illness or people who have been exposed to droplets or secretions from around the time of the hospital admission. We can also offer meningococcal vaccination to the close contacts once serotype results have made themselves available. And this might also involve booster doses to those who have had the meningococcal vaccine as part of their routine childhood vaccinations. So I've highlighted ciprofloxacin within 24 hours in red because that's something that's very high yield and you do need to know the prophylaxis treatment for close contacts. Something else to consider is that rifampicin can also be given as an alternative to ciprofloxacin. The ciprofloxacin is the drug of choice. So that's why I've highlighted it and underlined it in red. Okay. So just to clarify, ciprofloxacin is given to close contacts within 24 hours. Alternatively, rifampicin can be given, and again, we want to give that within 24 hours, but ciprofloxacin is the drug of choice. So that marks the end of my meningitis video today. Hopefully you found it quite helpful. If you have enjoyed my video today, please can I kindly ask you to like my video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much for watching and I wish you all the best in your exams.